Welcome back, viewers. Jumping back into the fray here with John Lane. John, how are you doing this morning or evening in your case? Uh, good, thanks, Louis. Yeah, and, and, and you well? Doing well. Still uh, trying to put up with these uh, leftists over here in the United States who are weaponizing COVID-19 regulations, but holding my own at the moment. Well, there's no shortage of leftists, mate. No question, man. They're multiplying like rabbits over here in the States, let me tell you. So speaking of multiplying and procreating, we're going to start off today, as promised when we ended our last program, on the question of humane vitae. One of our viewers uh, put forth a question about humane vitae, the subject of sedificantism, and how it reflects on Paul VI in that light. And you'd like to know your thoughts on that topic. There's an awful lot that we can say. What do you think about this? Wow, Louis, it's a big subject, but um, it, it's one of those uh, fantastic situations in which um, a modernist comes out with something that's thoroughly modernist. <laughs> Uh, and because there's a little uh, germ of Catholic truth buried in the middle of it, um, uh, the you know the conservatives queue up to praise and the and the liberals queue up to to condemn, and um, it, it's just it, that that document was was beyond disastrous. Um, the the context probably uh, is probably needed to to make it really clear. Um, so there's a doctrinal context and there's an historical context. So the doctrinal context is th that marriage uh, conceptually amongst modern people is primarily thought of as, as, a, as a, a, a sort of a, almost a private matter. So it's, it's the union of these two people um, for their mutual enjoyment, comfort, support, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and if you put a Christian veneer on that um, – uh, it's it's for their you know the mutual aid to salvation you know a cure for concupiscence and and then you know the various you know the assistance that we give each other in, in getting to heaven and uh, that's truly a veneer because marriage in 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 uh, in the Christian understanding is is actually ordained to an end so it's it has a purpose and that purpose is outside the marriage okay it's a social purpose um, it is the continuation of the human race. And then, so considered in its, in its natural, natural law aspect, right? So that is the end of marriage, considered as the reason that God instituted it. Okay, is is to is to provide for the continuation of the human race. Now, this is this is obvious as soon as you think about it for for two seconds, right? Is it, why did God make Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, and just not leave Adam alone? It, because He wanted to propagate a race from Adam. Yeah. And so marriage is for that purpose. Once you then look at it in its supernatural light, so it's been raised to the dignity, dignity of a sacrament, um, and the union that is marriage is, is compared to the union of Christ and his church. It's the most beautiful thought. Uh, its, its end is then the propagation of the church. So, so then we're looking at procreation and education of children, but for a supernatural end, so for that there'll be more Christians. Okay, the church will flourish. You will have more members, and there'll be more people serving God in this life and being happy with Him uh, forever in the next. Yeah, so that's what marriage is. It's, it it has this end outside of itself, and marriage is a means to that end. It's a means, and everything else in marriage is there to aid that. I mean, this is all integral, right? So, so when God creates, you know, He's much cleverer than we are. Um, and, but, but consider, uh, for instance, the pleasure of the marriage act. St. Thomas says that the reason that God made this act uh, pleasurable is is to give an incentive to men to engage in it, because a purely rational man, <laughs> who wasn't driven by his passions at all, uh, might want to evade his duty to to propagate the human race, yeah? Like it's it's a burden having children. Yeah, it makes So he sense. made women beautiful, he made women attractive, he made them irresistible almost, right? So that, that we, we'd want one <laughs> and and we'd be inclined to fulfill this 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 per, this higher purpose, right? So, so in other words, God gives us command um, and he makes it easy to obey. 
he facilitates. So that's the right ordering of these things. And then, of course, he makes it so that, so that well, if I'm going to stick these two people together in this lifelong union, and it needs to be lifelong because the children need to be, you know, that's, that's the only way to make sure that children have a good upbringing. You know, fatherless families are a, a, a disaster. And, uh, and so, so that, that mutual support of husband and wife, that, that's all considered as a means, you know, another mean, you know, an element of, of, the, of, the, of the nature of marriage as a means to this end. So if you see that structure, when you talk about the ends of marriage, uh, you're talking about the primary end, and then you talk about all these other things as like secondary ends, so say the mutual support of the husband and wife. Even that doesn't capture it unless you also add the word and subordinate. And Pius XII did this, when, when, and, and I think Pius the, the 11th and Casti Cognabi. Uh, when they're talking about the ends of marriage, they, they, do, they not only say there's a primary and a secondary end, but that the secondary end is subordinate to the primary end. It sits under. Exactly. Because, yes. And so when you see this thing teleologically, when you see this thing in terms of, of its end, when you see this thing in terms of Aristotelian, Thomistic, philo philosophical concepts and language, uh, then you can see how it all lines up and it's all integrated and it's all serving the one purpose and it, and it all makes sense. And if it all makes sense, then when you're instructing people in it, they get it. <laughs> and if they get it, they're inclined to go along with it, right? So that's the doctrinal context. The historical context is that even before Vatican II, even before uh, John the Twenty Third was elected, there was a, a, a bit of a, a heterodox move on the part of people like Hildebrand, uh, not sorry, Hildebrand, um, yeah, von Hildebrand, uh, the, the, uh, the German, um, and some other Germans, uh, I can't remember the names off the top of my head, who were proposing this, um, this view of marriage that was essentially personalist. And so it was looking at it in what is from our point of view, from a Catholic, Aristotelian, Thomistic point of view, an essentially subjective view of marriage. So it was looking at it uh, from the point of view of the two people and their mutual support, their love, their union, okay? And then seeing procreation as a natural sort of consequence of that. So it's downstream. And so uh, the Holy Office actually uh, was asked whether this was orthodox, formally asked, and the answer came back: No, this cannot be held. This, this is this is wrong. And Pius the Twelfth ordered this to be published and uh, and declared a law of the Church. So so it was squashed. Um, so then Vatican II. Well, then then what happened was John the Twenty Third. Um, so th so this is this is the context in which obviously the question of contraception could arise okay is is in the concept in the con in the context of marriage so um now I made some notes just so I can get the facts right because uh, this is actually uh, I th I think it's quite interesting um so now we're going to talk about let's just talk about contraception as a as a uh, as a particular moral question now the prohibition of artificial contraception is at least absolutely certain by virtue of the ordinary universal magisterium this is why the question just just can't be opened up by Catholics, right? not even by theologians. So, in other words, certain. John, you're saying the question was not a question at all, at least it's not, not for question. faithful Catholics. Exactly. Okay. It's a question with an absolutely certain answer by the Church. So, therefore, as you say, it's it's not to be questioned. Uh, now, Ron Kelly, John the Twenty Third, appointed a pontifical commission um, in 1963 to examine this question as though it were no, an open question. Uh, so that in itself was a revolutionary act to, to establish a commission into something that everybody agreed was a closed question. Now, he only appointed a few members to that, but Paul VI then expanded it. Now, you've got to remember, historically, what, what was going on at the time is, is I think artificial contraception sort of hit the, hit the market in the late 50s, about 58, 59. Um, so in 63, it's pretty early days, you know. Um, 
And if if the church had acted decisively on the question, um, which it could have, because it, it didn't need to, <laughs> you know, find out what it thought, <laughs> um, then uh, and you and you got to remember the Lambeth Conference uh, in 1930 had very scandalously the Anglicans had very scandalously approved artificial contraception. So. She already had um, a great ferment that had occurred, and the church had made her position completely clear. In fact, um, just talking about alacrity of action, uh, Pius XI issued uh, his encyclical on marriage, answering this within a year. Right. So, John, yeah, I'm glad you so, brought that up. So, do you think it's fair to say that part of the impetus on the part of John the Twenty Third and Paul the Sixth was an ecumenical desire? because the Lambeth Conference had done what it did in 1930, to kind of smooth out the ecumenical road, so to speak. Yeah, but, um, at least in a broad sense, yes, because the, the, the issue in the church in the 20th century was that the perennial philosophy uh, was no longer, it, it wasn't so much that it was no longer taught in the seminaries, because it was, um, it was no longer really grasped. There was a very weak grasp of, because modern life is so contrary in, in all of its assumptions and, the, and and everything everything about modern life is contrary to to the Aristotelian Thomistic worldview, so that so that what you had is you had people who who are constantly um, hearing sort of thought slogans, if you like, that are contrary to 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 a proper way to see things, to reality, um, and so there's this conflict constantly, and I think that you know between the faith and and the world. Um, but the faith hasn't got that philosophical support, that intellectual support that, that it should have. It's, you know, grace builds on nature. So nature being vitiated, you, you had this unstable faith. So if that's a true description of the sort of intellectual state of, of, of the world in, and particularly and of the church in, in the 20th century, then when something like, you know, uh, the Lambeth Conference uh, happened and approved contraception, um, it wasn't obvious what the answer was, and and it was obvious to the church, right? but it wasn't obvious to the laity. So so when people, so you end up with this situation where people, they're sort of almost fideist because they haven't got the intellectual support for their faith, and so they they hear that the, the church is against this, you know, that prohibits this, and it just, just seems like a, um, uh, a sort of a. Um, it's a bit like God banning pork, you know. It just doesn't seem to have any connection with the natural law. Yeah, it's just it sort of hangs there as this prohibition. It's like a, a taboo is probably the best word for it. Instead of seeing what it is, which is that it's a violent attack on the on the true nature of marriage, and if it's that, it'll destroy it. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Like, even if you can't see how it'll destroy it, it will if it's if it's if it really is an attack on you know at the roots of, of marriage in, in its very nature. It's going to so people didn't see that. So yeah, I think there was a desire to get along with the Protestants and agree with them, but I don't think that was the primary driver. I think that uh, the the primary driver was probably the fact that this loss of clarity in relation to true philosophy, and therefore this in, incapacity to really analyze things properly and to and to, to see them in their true light. And then, of course, we got the other factor, which is that the church under Pius XII had condemned this new way of looking at things, uh, and John the Twenty Third uh, institutes this commission, and Paul the Sixth comes out ultimately with his encyclical, which which really affirms all the false ideas of the modernists and the, and the personalists, but still maintains the taboo. Right. Right. Which is right. And that was bound to fail, right? Nobody was going to buy that. It's not intellectually consistent. It doesn't hang together. There's not a. So, so let's just go back to this, this commission um, just briefly. So, so the commission was expanded by Paul VI to include 72 members, including, I think, seven cardinals and something like 12 bishops, uh, a bunch of lay people, a bunch of theologians, just, just this huge committee, you know, and, and, <laughs> You know, a, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. Um, well, well. Anyway, th this this committee didn't even get to uh, to design a camel because what happened was uh, it became clear, and it lasted for years. It lasted for years, and all this time, the Catholic faithful are 
have been it's been communicated to them by the action of John the 23rd in opening this up and establishing the commission and then by reinforced by Paul the 6th in expanding this commission uh, to 72 members um, that this is an open question and so you know what happened <laughs> everybody started using contraception started using the pill not everybody you know so by the time Humano Vita came out and was it 68 uh, you know, half the Catholic married world was probably using it or something. I mean, it was just some very large percentage. They're addicted to it already. And then you come along and say, aha, taboo still stands. So this is like satanic. Sure, John. And didn't we have pastors all over the world telling the faithful that an approval is coming? They fully expected that that's what was going to come. Look, and you can't quite blame them for expecting that of Paul VI. You know, if you and I were uh, watching closely in 1965, knowing Paul VI for who he was, yeah, you know, did, was there any reasonable expectation that he would uphold the true faith? So I think you have pastors encouraging the faithful. Well, yeah, it's going to get approved eventually. And so they essentially gave the go-ahead. Exactly. And, 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 so, and so you had that situation, which was just... I'll say it's satanic because, because obviously... Um, for those people who, who, anyway, those people were suddenly, you know, let's say they were innocent morally in using it, thinking that it was okay because their priest said it was okay, and you know, famous theologians said it was okay. Uh, then they're told it's a mortal sin. They're addicted to its use. They, you know, they've they've gotten used to this whole new way of seeing marriage, and suddenly they're uh, they're in, involved in mortal sin. I, Anyway, you, you can see the evil of that. It's, be, it's beyond evil. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's truly satanic, you know. Um, I wouldn't see, be surprised if it was responsible on its own for a very great percentage of the loss of faith in the wake of Vatican II for that reason. Certainly. And this points to, not to go down that rabbit hole once again, because we've talked about it, I think, quite enough, but it goes to the identity of the institution that's pulling this stunt on his children. Or is this loving the, mother. Right. Is this the behavior of Holy Mother Church? Absolutely not. No. no. No, and I think when you see, we'll get to, you know, a little bit more of the doctrinal detail. I, th I think um, it'll be even clearer that we're, we're not dealing with Catholic doctrine here. We're, we're dealing with, you know, this is the voice, as Archbishop Lefebvre said on the council floor, uh, not of the, of, the, of the shepherd, but of the wolf. Right. Um, so... So this commission, um, in uh, about sixty six, I think it was, uh, found itself at, at uh, you know, completely deadlocked because because you had people determined that the teaching of the church could change, and then you had people like Ottaviani who sat on it. I think he was the chairman. Terrible thing to do to him to appoint him as chairman of that. Um, and uh, and he was obviously completely clear that the, the, the teaching of the church can't change on anything. And, um, and so they, they knew they weren't going to agree and be able to produce a, uh, uh, a set of recommendations or, uh, to, to the so-called Holy Father. So the majority, um, when I say the majority, something like 67 members or something voted in favour of a majority report which was then published, which approved artificial contraception, and um, and then Paul VI sat on that, sat on that situation for another couple of years before he came out with Humane Vito. So of course that reinforced this idea that this is an, not just an open question, but that many you know bishops, cardinals, <laughs> theologians, all agree that not only is it not wrong, it's it's fine. It's John, fine. John, historical question for you. I, I think I recall hearing that that majority report was leaked to the press by one of by oh, some yeah. committee members, right? So it was published. That's right. Okay. Yeah, it was published. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it was officially published by the commission. Right. It was kind. Of, it was leaked. Something that we see a lot yeah, of today in politics. But yeah, 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 yeah. Which which was no doubt the intention of those who come up with the idea of let's let's produce a majority report, you know, so that at least the Holy Father knows what we think. And and the people know what's coming. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, very duplicitous. It. I got it. That's it. So okay. So so um, 
Oh, there were 16 bishops on the uh, on, on the commission. There you go. Okay, so the, the, the other thing to see is that the entire question was miscast from the beginning. So John the Twenty Third's uh, the title of this commission was was this papal or pontifical commission for the study of the problems of the family, population, and birth rate. So, yeah, so. Population's a problem. Birth rate, therefore, needs to be looked at hard, and the family will be the victim. <laughs> and it's a complete inversion of the Catholic, of the naturally Catholic way of seeing these things, yeah. which is that, which is that the family is is in itself a not just a noble institution, but marriage is a sacrament, <laughs> very very noble. It has this very noble end, which is social. It's outside of itself. That it's it, it's it's for the common good, and in the supernatural realm, you know, in the realm of, of of the Christian era, it's it's for the propagation of the church. Just so wonderful, right? And all the previous popes had had fallen over themselves dressing these ideas in the most beautiful language, and in the language of Holy Writ, you know, which is just full of similes. Showing what a glory children are to their parents, you know, and the, the fruitful vine and you know the fruitful olive tree and all this, you know, fruitfulness is just praised all through Holy Scripture. So, so you've got you've got uh, that the, the 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 family is 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 primary when talking about these things. Okay, so that's the first perversion. The second perversion is that the 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 birth rate is a blessing. You know, go forth and multiply, contrary to the Protestant interpretation. Is not a command. It's a blessing. I think from memory, uh, Abraham was given a similar blessing, and maybe Noah as well. So, so th this idea that you know your 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 offspring will be as mu you know multiplied by the, like the sands of the sea or whatever, this is a, this is a blessing by by, by God. Um, so birth rate's a good thing, and then of course population. Well, we're talking about the population of the church. <laughs> if we're talking about Christian marriage, right. <laughs> That's a great point, John. Well, the, showed... the title of this yeah. commission alone, you're right, it's, a, it's, it's patently it's obvious that it's an attack against Christian doctrine. But more than that, it, it's an attack against God himself. The God who blessed us with this opportunity to be fruitful and multiply, if you yeah. buy into the popul overpopulation myth, what you're essentially doing is indicting God of not providing for us, as if the world in which he created cannot sustain fruitful multiplication and the blessing that we've been given. It's like telling God that the world you created is not good enough. We need to take control of this thing because you didn't provide. It's, it, it, it's flat denial of divine providence. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. So Paul VI had essentially given into the idea that population, overpopulation is a real problem. Oh yeah, he's he's promoting it, and and he'd already he'd already um, essentially promoted it in Populo Progressio. You know, in a, uh, I think that was an encyclical uh, uh, a year or two before. So he he had taken seriously the idea that the world might be uh, you know heading for overpopulation, and the, the whole Pearl Ehrlich, you know, you know predictions of doom. Uh, um, you know, God's left us here alone, and we're going to have to work all this out ourselves. And 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 if we're not responsible. Um, you know, that idea. Okay, so guess what? In Humane Vitae, um, marriage, uh, a good marriage is defined as a uh, as a responsible marriage. Um, and so suddenly we have the idea that, that having too many children would be irresponsible. Right. Um, yeah. So so and then that's a strong theme in the in the document. Um, but let, let's just go back to this. Um, to the uh, uh, to some of the text of Humane Vitae, just just at the beginning, um, so he he opens up with um, he opens up with the population problem, right? So the rapid increase in population, which has made many fear that the world population is going to grow faster than available resources, with the consequence that many families in developing countries would be faced with greater hardships. Um, and it then proceeds to describe normal families as though they are exceptional. It gives them the adjective large. 
Modern conditions make it, quote, frequently difficult these days to provide properly for a large family, unquote. Now, I submit that what he's doing there is he's redefining uh, a normal family, a full-sized family, as a large family. You know, this right. is totally contrary to the naturally Christian outlook, right? Uh, you know, uh, I know. Look, amongst traditionalists, um, what I'm about to say will we'll, we'll just strike it just seemed like common sense um, and the way things are, but but outside the the realm of tradition, it it will sound um, like a novelty almost. But the world of the 1950s church uh, and for 2,000 years prior, I think, always saw things this way, and that is that um, a a family with two or three children uh, is is a small family. Um, a family with six, seven, eight children is 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 a full sized family. Uh, and if you wanted to describe a large family, you might think of someone like St. Catherine of Siena, who was the 25th child of her parents. <laughs> I'd call that a large family. Sure. Um, so, you know, describing normal families, you know, where, where naturally six, seven, eight, nine, ten children arrive uh, over the course of the marriage as large and, uh, and that this may be a problem, um, difficult for people to manage, you know, et cetera, et cetera, because of modern conditions. You go, what, in our super affluent 20th century um, post-industrial revolution society it, 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 it's mind-blowing right? John think the, the thing, perversity of those. yeah as you're saying that the yeah, thing that's no. striking me is the, the blatant contradiction <laughs> we had just emerged from the second Vatican Council Gaudium et Space in particular which was one of the last documents to come yeah. out of the council that effusively praised modern man for all of his achievements and, and his technological capabilities and how they're so stellar in our day. And yet now we have this document telling us that there's greater hardships in our day in developing countries with raising families. Which is it? Is it one or the other? Yeah. The logic is in our day, as Humanae Vitae is being written as compared to previous ages, it's far yeah. easier to raise a large family than it ever has been. I, absolutely. Uh, I mean, just just at certainly at a greater level of comfort, uh, in greater security um, than in many previous times. It's just anyway. I've told my children the whole time they were growing up, and I remind them of this frequently. You know, these are the good old days. You know, I was saying this 20 years ago. These are the good old days. Enjoy them, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, one day you you look back and go, yeah, they were the good old days. So enjoy them while while you're having them, because it was. You know, it's been a, it's it's been it's been great and. It's not without its struggles, obviously, particularly financial struggles. Um, but those financial struggles have got to be put in context. You're talking about the uh, the fact that you can't afford a new car. Right. Mm -hmm. First world you know, problem, I, right? Yeah, it's absolutely all first world problem. You know, you know. Uh, I mean, this has never actually happened to me, but you know, I can imagine a situation in which you've got you, your car's broken down, you can't afford the, the the bill for the mechanic, and so you have to take public transport to work. <laughs> You know, in the cold and the dark, you know, I mean, terrible. Just think about what someone from the Middle Ages would have thought of that right. as a hardship. You know, is it, anyway, I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. So, yeah, so he, he that's the context in which he, he raises this at the beginning. This is the context of the whole discussion. Right? And he's going to introduce this idea of responsible parenthood. Right. And and that is about how many children you have, amongst other things, right? So, um, the... Yeah, and just to finish the point about the size of families, you know, um, without offending anybody, I hope, um, the fact is that the people who are childless are pitied by others and they lament the fact themselves as a rule. You know, often they'll they'll reconcile, you know, they'll, they'll reconcile themselves to, to God's will in the matter, but uh, it's, it's certainly not a source of happiness. It's a source of unhappiness in a marriage. Um, and... You know, Saint Elizabeth, it, it, when 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 God blessed her with Saint John the Baptist, um, said that God had taken away her reproach, her reproach, her shame. Right. Mm -hmm. John, you remind me of something that I've said it, uh, hundreds of times. You know, we look at Bergoglio, this man who's known as Francis. I, I'm sure you recall his uh, comments about people shouldn't be breeding like rabbits, or something along those lines, where he's essentially. Direct Right, a yep. direct line. He's con direct line. condemning those who yep. have large families, have this great blessing from God of a large family. Uh, it's, it's important to keep as in if, mind. As if it's a choice. 
as if it's a choice to have a large family. Right, to choose. It's not. It's a choice to have a small family. Right. Okay. It's a blessing to have a large family. But he's not making anything up. It's not up. a choice. <clears throat> right, I right. agree. Sorry. No, so the point is, Francis isn't inventing anything new. He's riding on the coattails of the conciliar men who came before him. Paul VI is setting the table for a Francis in this document when he's speaking of large families as if they're a burden. So I, I'm yep. sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, no. That's that's it's good. It's a, it's a good discussion. So so, all right. So so sterility is awful, and 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 the birth rate <laughs> is a blessing, and this has inverted that. Okay. So, and then and then he finishes he finishes with uh, this sort of beginning section, and he talks about some other things, and 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 uh, and he and he hits you with the awful news that um, contraceptions are not allowed. And he declares, incredibly, I think, the church does not, quote, evade the duty imposed on her of proclaiming humbly but firmly the entire moral law, both natural and evangelical. Since the church did not make either of these laws, she cannot be their arbiter, only their guardian and interpreter, unquote. Well, that is exactly the duty he's, in, he's evading while he, while he laments the fact that he's not allowed to, because as we will see, uh, this document does not present Catholic doctrine. Um, it set the stage for how it's going to undermine Catholic doctrine, and then it proceeds to do so. Uh, viewers, uh, our apologies for the technical difficulties here. You're going to have to put up with just our voice, and you don't get to see our faces anymore, which might be another blessing for you today. But let's continue the conversation. John, so you were saying that uh, Paul VI spoke of the church not evading the duty of proclaiming the entire moral law, and yet that's exactly what he's doing in this document. I think that's where we left off. He is, because after after uh, after um, uh, uh, opening up and 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 starting to to uh, you know talk about population and <laughs> these um, these obviously relevant <laughs> modern concerns. Um, he goes on and he says, also noteworthy is a new understanding of the dignity of woman and her place in society, unquote. Right. So what is this saying? Uh, is it saying the church uh, has been outdone by modern man who's, who's now got this new understanding of the dignity of woman and, and, and we'll need to adjust our doctrine because this finding is so <laughs> – is an addition to human knowledge? I mean – it's it's frightening to think what that's really saying, um, as if the church has ever had a problem with the dignity of you know recognizing the dignity of women, you know we who have the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, as our greatest saint, um, we who took woman, who was in a degraded state in every pagan culture, and placed her on a pedestal. Exactly, uh, yeah, these modernists, John. That's one thing that they all have in common is a, a certain embarrassment. Uh, about the church and her history and her teachings and her doctrines as though the church has been archaic and backwards and behind the times for centuries now. It's time to get caught up. Yes, you know, but Louis, you know, we're talking about, you know, in the, um, uh, the, the Creator, you know, the, um, uh, it talks about, um, renewing the face of the earth. You know, Christ transformed society so thoroughly that modern man, including Catholics generally, actually are unaware of it. Christi Christianity so transformed our society that all the modern errors are perversions of Christian ideas. Right. Whether it's, you know, false equality, which is, you know, egalitarianism. Uh, or or um, feminism, which is a perversion of, of the elevation of women. Um, uh, it, it just goes on and on, right? So 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 the the thing that's so striking about this particular the reason I'm mentioning that in this context is because you know noteworthy is a new understanding of the dignity of woman and her place in society. Um, it, it's it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning to think what women's place was under the Romans prior to Christ or in India today or in China or in Africa in any pagan culture 
uh, th- there's no place where woman has the place she has uh, in Western society as a result of Christ, of his teachings. Of course, look at the way women are treated in Islam. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, anyway, so he says that, and then he says um, in the same sentence, uh, so this new understanding of the dignity of a woman and her place in society and of the value of conjugal love in marriage and of the relationship of conjugal acts to this love. Now, here we have him stating, he is referring to the very ideas condemned by the Holy Office and ordered to be published by Pius XII, specifically ordered to be published by Pius XII and made a, a public law, Okay. The value of conjugal love in marriage and the relationship of conjugal acts to this love, right? So this subjectivist view, this view that marriage is has its end in itself, that it's that it's just a relation between two people. It's not a social thing. Its end is an outside of itself. Okay, that's what that's that's setting us up for. Anybody who's awake will know exactly where that premise is going to land you. Okay, it is emphasising the value of conjugal conjugal love rather than procreation and education of children. So as to provide a logical foundation for the idea that a deliberately barren marriage is as integral a marriage as one which is living in obedience to God and with a loving trust in divine providence. That's what's going on there. Right. And sure enough, uh, not not that far further on, it's not that long a document, actually. Anybody can read it quickly. The doctrinal heart of the encyclical is this statement. Quote, this particular doctrine... He's referring to the prohibition on con- uh, of contraception, often expounded by the magisterium of the church, is based on the inseparable connection established by God, which man on his own initiative may not break, between the unitive significance and the procreative significance, which are both inherent to the marriage act. <coughs> Did you understand that? Yes, absolutely. So, John, do you think it's coincidence that he listed them in that order? <laughs> No, of course not. It's, right. it's the personalism inherent in the whole thing, right? So, but those those terms demand those those key terms at the end there: unitive, unitive significance or unitive meaning, and procreative significance or procreative meaning, which are both inherent to the marriage act. What do those terms mean? They're, they're novelties, right? We don't we don't know what they mean. Right. Whereas we the church guess. used to speak of the ends of marriage as opposed to the significance, yes. which is something totally subjective. Exactly. And and so we're we this is the doctrinal heart of this encyclical, right? And mm. it's 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 not just ambiguous, it's 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 really indecipherable. And I'll tell you why. Because an orthodox mind coming to those words, right, which has got in mind that marriage is Social and marriage has the end as the, as the procreation, education of children, and and a secondary and subsidiary end uh, as the as the mutual comfort um, and assistance of the of the spouses, uh, and also as a cure for concupiscence. Someone with those ideas in their mind, reading that, will will read them into it. Will read those ideas in, yeah. He'll go, oh yeah, unitive significance. I guess that's a reference to the conjugal, you know, to love between the two people. Mm-hmm. And the procreative significance, ah, yeah, that's a reference to the to the primary end of marriage. Oh, well, he sort of put them the wrong way around, but that's that's not disastrous if he doesn't actually say that the second is second and the first is first. So, yeah, I guess I can live with that, you know. And a liberal reads it and says, good, no more of that Aristotelian, Aristotelian teleology, <laughs> no more of that imposing of ends by by God the creator on his creatures <laughs> uh, as though he had a purpose in creating <laughs> right exactly you know what I mean <clears throat> it it's and, and this really this is really an aside but you can see why there's such debates in the post Vatican II era and such lack of clarity uh, you know because everybody's bringing to these texts which are inherently ambiguous they're not defined the terms aren't defined and they're new Exactly. And and, there, and that subjectivism is being injected into a culture that's already losing its way. And so the tendency is to read it in a more liberal sense, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think oh, yeah. if, if, if a, a phrase like that was injected into the culture of 1925, 1940, 1950, the chances of it being read in an orthodox way, even though you'd have to labor to do it, 
much greater. In 1968, the uh, the fix was already in. <laughs> Everybody was prepared well, and, to read it in a new way. No, of course, and 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 of course, they've had the majority report of the Pontifical Commission. Right, Pontifical, um, exactly. Had, you know, they've had Charles Curran and Richard McBride and all these people running around promoting their. You know, you, you've just got this whole impression. And when I say impression, I don't want to suggest that it's weak in any way. It, it's 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 a it's a it's a very strong impression Certainly. created by the Vatican and the bishops and the authorized theologians that this is an open question and that you can you can decide to use artificial contraception with a good conscience. Exactly. Uh, um, and then the only person who disagrees with you is poor old Paul the Sixth and. Uh, and he's not giving you any good reason because he's undermined the whole basis for the traditional doctrine. Exactly. John, there's a uh, sentence I want to read to uh, viewers who are now listeners <laughs> taken from Humanae Vitae, which is much more explicit in flip-flopping the ends of marriage. And the text reads, quote, the fundamental nature of the marriage act while uniting husband and wife in the closest intimacy also renders them capable of generating life. So here it's as if yeah. generating new life, it's just an afterthought. It, it's just something that just, yeah. it might come as by virtue of the act of uniting husband and wife. Then again, it might not. It's, it's, that is subordinated all of a sudden to the mutual yes. help of the spouses in, in the unitive act. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a side blessing. Uh, exactly. It arises from this wonderful thing that God created, which is which enables love. <laughs> um, yeah, and 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 sometimes this wonderful blessing comes, and sometimes it doesn't, like many other blessings of providence. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, but it's certainly not essential. Um, yeah, it's amazing. So there you go. That's um, that's probably all I really want to say about humanae vitae. I think it's um, it's. It's the key things are that it, it 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 omits Catholic doctrine. I mean, for example, there's there's not a whisper in there about obedience of the wife to the head of the house. Oh, of um, course not. Yeah, of course not. Um, there's a disgusting little section that um, that seems to be comparing uh, what I think is essentially an artificial concept, marital rape with the use of artificial contraception. I think what you meant to think from reading it is that there are disordered ways of using the Marriage Act, and one is to impose your will upon an unwilling wife, and the other way is to frustrate the natural end of it. Mm -hmm. um, what a pathetic comparison. Um, and... Um, but also, you know, I guess you need that type of thing if you abandon the sort of logical, coherent, traditional understanding, which, from which, just naturally and forcefully arises the idea that 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 frustrating the end of the marriage act would be would be wrong, right? If you've demolished all that, then you need something else to try and sell this prohibition. Um, so I, I think what he's trying to do is sort of put it in a bad light. Um, by by placing it next to this other bad thing, which, again, you know, contraception is 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 was already widely being practiced and was a real problem. And marital rape. Um, anyway, yeah. <laughs> what can you say about that? But surely, surely that was not something that was going on in half of marriages out there, right? Exactly. <laughs> and needed to be excoriated, you know. I don't know. It's just it's just a terrible, terrible. So there you go, Louis. Yeah, and it's amazing how you know conservative Catholics will treat Humanae Vitae as if it was the crowning achievement of the Montini pontificate, and and they'll often speak of him as if he was prophetic, because he lists in Humanae Vitae a number of ills that may unfold from the widespread use of contraception, but the fact of the matter is he created every one of the ills that he said would unfold from that event by essentially putting the unitive above the procreative and making 
the procreation and education of children seem like just an option that's easily done away with. And now what we have to show for it is the fact that we really do have a birth rate problem on planet Earth. But it's the opposite problem. Well, we don't have enough well, children right. being born. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and again, you know, you, you can see the connection of all the other evils that flowed. Um, because because if you think going back to, 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 OK, marriage is instituted for this end, the propagation of the human race and in the Catholic context for the proper propagation of the church, for the population of heaven. Okay? Right. <laughs> that's what marriage is for, for a Christian to populate heaven. And then, you know, why did God make the act so pleasurable? Right, to to attract men and to make it easy for men to fulfil this um, this duty of of this social end, which they were, which marriage is uh, is for. Um, now you take away that doctrine, and and you're opening the way to uh, onanism, to fornication, um, to self abuse. Um, and to every sexual perversion you want to name, because because now you've got this personalist idea, which which implicitly declares that the happiness of the individual is the highest good, because marriage has been instituted to make people happy in this world, right, and to aid them, you know, give them give them comfort and etc. Right? You see how it yes. follows? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all of a piece. And you and you and you and so you do end up and I remember this very clearly from my teen years. Um, you know, I had a good primary school education by traditional nuns, but I had an awful five years with the Christian brothers. And I, I remember getting to the point where I, I really didn't understand all of these prohibitions. I mean, I say I didn't understand them. I held to them when I, I knew what was a sin and what wasn't, I think. Um, but I couldn't really defend them. Mm -hmm. that's what Paul VI did he stripped Catholics who who didn't have anything but his and his confrères um, doctrine of any capacity to rationally defend God's law exactly and John you mentioned earlier how satanic this entire operation is and you yes. have to hand it to the evil one he's he's incredibly clever he, he's this is a situation where people who genuinely want or wanted to be Catholic simply accepted that what was being handed to them was being delivered by Holy Mother Church when nothing could have been further from the truth it was a master stroke of evil genius on Satan's That's part it. no question about it yeah John I think we yep. would be remiss if we wrapped it up without uh, having a brief conversation at least about natural family planning and where that fits ah. into this conversation. Well, um, do you have something to say about it or do you, you just want my comments? I'd like to hear your comments from the standpoint of all that the church taught in the past and how natural yeah. family planning is presented as a way for traditional Catholics to regulate the, the sizes of their families. And when is it uh, actually an illicit thing to do to deliberately thwart the procreative process through NFP as it's called. Yeah. So so considering everything we've we've discussed about the, the true doctrine of the church, the true doctrine of the of the church and the you know the natural law um etc. You can see that uh it certainly is well, it's just a fact that each act of cohesion um is in itself lawful as long as there's nothing done to frustrate the the end of that act. So that's certainly true, and and that's the sort of foundation for the idea that the the use of the sterile period only um, is lawful. But it's not the only doctrinal consideration that that is relevant to the question of 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 what's called natural family planning, because that's not about a single act. Yeah, that's about a habitual approach. And so the theologians prior to Vatican II, uh, forget the ones after for obvious reasons, 
um, did have a little bit of a debate going on, and the debate was between those who held, which is which is my view, uh, for what that's worth, <laughs> um, that actually uh, to use only the sterile period for a, for a short for a short period, so f- you know, a few months, uh, without a good cause, would be venially sinful. Exactly. To do so longer, mm-hmm. yeah. To do so longer term without a very grave cause would be mortally sinful. Right, John. That's exactly the uh, opinion that I've read and seems to make sense to me. And one of the things that, um, in fact, I have in mind, I can't remember the name of the priest who wrote the essay that I, I'm recalling at the moment, uh, but he makes the one uh, clarification that in the case where a husband and wife choose to abstain with the motive in mind to perhaps make of that an occasion of mortification to deepen their holiness, that, that that's the oh, that's solitary different. conditions under which it's not at least venially sinful. No, 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 no. What so, do you think of that opinion? So that's, that's if there's no, 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 because there is, I think all moral theologians agree that there certainly could be a circumstance in which a couple um, could see that having another child, at least, you know, for a substantial period, would be um, would be a big problem. Okay, so for example, think about say um, where the where the doctors have made it clear that if you have another child, you know the, the the, the wife has, has had serious health problems during pregnancy. Uh, each pregnancy has resulted in more severe health problems. Um, and, um, you know, something like preeclampsia. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it does. That, that's typical, right? The, 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 you might get your fifth, sixth, seventh child and, and notice that, no, hang on, this is getting worse. And then, you know, the woman almost dies in childbirth. She survives... And then there's a serious discussion. The doctor's saying, look, you, you try again, and I'm telling you, she, she's, she's very unlikely to survive the next pregnancy. And you've got six, seven children, um, you know, who are 10 years old and younger. That would be a very good reason, I think, and a, certainly a, a proportionate reason to decide not to have any further children um, and use what's called natural family, family planning. I mean, that's a terrible term for it. Um, to take advantage only of the sterile period, um, to avoid having uh, to to avoid her becoming pregnant again, um, because otherwise you're depriving the children. I mean, the, the fear is you're depriving the children of their mother, um, and you know. So at least there's proportion there, Louis. Yeah. Is this something and, that the traditional theologians have addressed directly, John? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. As I say, this that that view that view that I expressed first about you know that it'd be venially sinful without a proportionate cause, right? And mortally sinful over a longer period without a proportionate cause. That's the stricter view. Um, the, the laxer view amongst authorised theologians prior to Vatican II was that, was that it would be that... I mean, I just think this is, this is a bad opinion, right? But, the, the, but it was tolerated by the Church that since each act is in itself lawful... Um, you can't say that 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 uh, that any series of those acts would be unlawful. Is this is the way the sort of argument goes? But I think this is to to you know, that I think that's typical of the sort of loss of the Aristotelian Thomistic uh, teleological view of things. You know, you, 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 they've lost the context. Um, so so because they're not seeing they're not seeing that. Um, what the marriage, what the end of marriage is. Um, they're just thinking about that particular act um, on that particular occasion and then just saying, well, it's just a lot of those. But it's not just a lot of those acts. <laughs> it's, a, it's a plan, right? So, and it's frustrating the end for which marriage was instituted. So, so it's, it's sinful for that reason. So anyway, look, there was a difference of opinion. So you, you've got to be very careful. Um, and particularly, you've got to be very careful this is a delicate pastoral area, and you'll often hear traditional priests even who'll say to 
to people, don't touch that subject. Leave that to the priest to discuss with individuals, you know, um, because what you don't want is you don't want to be giving people scruples who've been advised soundly that they have a good reason. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, I mean, anyway, the, the, but that's sort of ba that's basically it. So natural family planning as, you know, natural family, well, the very term is wrong. <laughs> the idea of natural family planning, as though you should be in charge of deciding how many children you have and, and at what spacing, et cetera, um, I think is, is a rotten idea. It's typically modern. Um, it's losing sight of the of the true purpose of marriage. Um, it's not trusting in pro divine providence. Um, there's there's so much wrong with it. Um, Absolutely, and it would seem to me the the seeds of abortion are planted in there. Uh, oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it's just a hint, but the seeds are definitely there, and they can blossom. And we've seen that happen in our culture. But that's a good point you make about the pastoral sensitivity of this conversation in this post humane vitae world where people are not conditioned to be able to think rationally about marriage and its primary end. So, John, I think yeah. we've uh, kind of run the course here today. What a great conversation. I really appreciate your insights on this. It's been fantastic. Thanks so much. Right. See you next week.